Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to uh, sort of one of the first uh, sort of podcasty video interview chats on particular topics that um, the HE team at Diversity and Ability are holding to look at everything disability and the intersections of. Uh, today's topic is disability and LGBT intersections and identity, um, or as I usually do in my workshops, queering disability. Um, for those that don't know, Diversity and Ability is a disabled-led uh, social enterprise that supports disabled people in work, at, in education, um, DSA support, that sort of thing, access to work. Uh, but also we do wider policy work. So my role at DNA is a higher education policy and partnerships lead. And I get the fun and great responsibility of uh, hosting these uh, chats. It's going to be informal. We're going to be talking about some uh, intersections and particular issues and barriers. So if, uh, if, if there are any particular content warnings, you'll find them uh, in the description and you'll have a timestamp to skip them if you would so like, um, just because we want this to be as accessible and inclusive to everyone. And uh, yeah, some content sucks. Today, I've got two wonderful guests with me. Um, I have Leo and Cassidy. They're going to be talking about themselves a little and um, to put them on the spot and make them awkward, uh, but also about uh, a little bit about education, a little bit about uh, uh, the solutions that we want to see the sector have and a little bit about uh, accessibility in student spaces. So cut a long story short, let's just introduce them. So uh, Leo, would you like to introduce yourself, please? Yes. Hello. My name is Leo. Um, I am the um disabled place on the volunteer campaign committee for the NUS which in short essentially means that I am the disabled officer but I don't get paid anymore because the NUS doesn't have any money anymore. Um, so I support the VP Liberation and Access, Sara Khan, to make sure that everything that we do is everything, all of the campaigns that we do have disabled students in mind and are accessible as well as supporting disabled activists on their campuses too network with each other and make change. Um, I am a trans queer disabled person, which is why I'm here. Um, and I really like talking about this topic because something that I'm very passionate about is disabled people's sexuality and the way that we are kind of consistently desexualized by everyone and everything all of the time. And the fact that a lot of disabled people don't feel able, and especially queer disabled people, don't feel able to kind of like claim our sexuality on our own terms and define what that means for us in a way that we can recognize not with the frame of reference of non-disabled sexuality cool uh, excellent and just to say uh leo is basically my uh, successor so um in everything they are more successful uh <laughs> you got was, paid though <laughs> i did i did except for being valued by the institution that they, yeah. they work for um so other than the, the fact that i got paid uh successful in every way cool and snazzy oh also my pronouns i forgot to say my pronouns he him and z here he him and z here mine are they them um they are also recorded under uh next to our names in brackets um for, for those that want to refer to them at a <laughs> at a uh, at a future point, um, Cassidy, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, um, I'm sorry, I couldn't. That was such a presentary voice. Hi, I'm Cassidy. Um, <laughs> I uh, my pronouns are they them, um, and I'm a non-binary um, disabled person. I work for DNA in the operations team, which means I make bookings for students um, and basically deal with everything that comes into DNA, which is students and all of our tutors, mentors and trainers and um, different inquiries from uh, different needs assessment centres and higher education providers and basically just set up um, support from first contact to um, often when students leave university. Um, so that's what I do for work. And I am writing my MA thesis, um, rewriting it in my head many times over, but I haven't actually written any of it. Um, and I'm writing it about um, anarchist alternatives to sex education um, and the failings of UK sex education. That's sort of lifelong work for me. I've been writing about it for years. Um, and I'm a trained sex educator and I'm very interested in the uh, 
the problem with sex education and disability, but also the problem with sex education and queerness. Um, but my research is focused on the problem with sex education and uh, carceral um, feminism. Um, so that's what I do. And I'm also training to be a uh, study skills tutor, which is one of the services we provide. So that's sort of my free time. The first question I have is uh, talking a little bit about your uh, experience as a student. Um, you're both students at the moment, but you've also been in education a little while as well. Um, as, a, as disabled queer people, um, what sort of barriers did you experience? What sort of um, sort of issues and uh, accessibility uh, access stuff did you encounter? Good, bad, the ugly, uh, to steal a film title. I think one of the like big problems is the kind of hyper visibility that both disability and queerness affords you. Like if you're someone who has like a visible disability, I don't love that terminology, but um, I am a wheelchair user. And also like, well, when I used to go outside was very like visibly queer. Again, like the visible invisible thing, it's like not a great way of looking at things, but I think that like there is something to be said for the hyper visibility that kind of gets put on you as a disabled queer person and it often makes you kind of like the the I think test case is slightly the wrong word but almost like people assume that because of that visibility you're kind of comfortable with your privacy being invaded and your space being intruded upon um I'm just thinking of all of the times that I've been like in clubs and people have thought that because I seem like a fun cool person it's okay to like grab my wheelchair and move me or like yeah just all of the times that like it's put a target on me rather than a shield because I like find comfort in being hyper visible sometimes because it feels like a, a way of like protecting myself with bright colors like animals that are poisonous in the wild but a lot of times I found that like yeah it seems it seems to just mark you out as someone who can be like touched and grabbed in without consent and asked questions without consent in a way that kind of you don't get I think a lot of the time if you're not like both of those things at once. Mm. I think there's also the um there's another thing that uh I think is a slightly different part of that which is like um in my instance I had to make my make myself visibly you know uh or make my I was going to say the troubles, that's a different thing. I make mean, the things <laughs> I was struggling with more visible um, in order for them to be kind of addressed in any way. And being somebody who is always outspokenly queer, that's not something I've ever had to make visible. But then there's this kind of attachment to like drama and it's sort of like, oh yeah, I've got all these problems and it's like, man, you're, you know, you're queer and that's sort of part of it, isn't it? It's like, no, it's not. I mean, it is in some ways, but not in the ways that the university needs to talk about. You know, like mm -hmm. if you're already somebody who is um, doing things in like a big queer activist group and you're very visible and then you're like, oh, and also, you know, I'm, I'm really struggling with my mental health. It sort of all gets bunched into the same thing. And it's very hard for you to be, um, you know, that the ideal subject, which is, um, you know, somebody who is who uh, works really hard and actually a sudden tragedy has befallen them and, and they're very unwell and you look after them and then they get back to a good health and then they sort of are quiet again, um, which, you know, isn't reality um, for most disabled people, but uh, for disabled queer people, that idea that you have to be kind of well behaved in order to be taken seriously is um, so prevalent in just like, you know, heterosexual discourse, let alone bringing in healthcare into it as well. Yeah, it's just, it's respectability politics magnified on both ends to make it just a very uncomfortable existence. And I think the point that you raised about activism is really interesting as well, because something that I've kind of consistently got from like doctors and study skills tutors and stuff is like, oh, do you think, do you think you should be doing that? Do you think, oh, you're doing an awful lot, aren't you, with the NUS and everything? Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, because literally no one else will do it. Because yeah. if I don't do it, like, it doesn't, it, it doesn't get done because that is the case. Like, it's something that I was speaking with a group of disabled students about recently. A lot of us feel like the kind of 
the, the difficult work that needs to happen in disability activism isn't something that non-disabled people want to trouble themselves doing because it's not cute mm -hmm. and it's not glamorous and it's not like it's not like rainbowy and fun uh, mm -hmm. even though that kind of activism is also not useful for queer people um yeah but yeah and it just it, it's 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 frustrating because you're faced with a situation where you're like if i do not spend too much energy fighting for this not only will things get worse for me but things will get yeah. worse for like all of my other disabled and queer comrades and then you have your doctors and and like benefits people and everyone telling you like oh i think you should maybe stop doing that because it seems like you can do quite a lot if you can do that and it's it's not a matter of choice it's a matter of necessity that is yeah that is one of the biggest things that i've complained about um uh in university kind of uh, not healthcare, but any kind of help that you get from university is that much like, you know, your mother, they'll say, um, well, are you, do, are you studying? That's the most important thing. Well, are you working because you need to pay to study because I've had to work full time for all the time that I'm studying. Okay, so those are the most, two most important things in your life. You have to work so that you can, you know, subsist and you have to study because that's what you, you've chosen to do. And all this extra stuff that you're doing, that's the stuff that you should get rid of. It's like, okay, but the stuff that, are, the extra stuff, which is like, challenging the university um you know challenging basically the uh the kind of the framework of what we have to live in which makes these things difficult in the first place that's the stuff you should get rid of and it's like I don't want my life to be defined by my job and you know just about getting to study it should be about more than that but you're right that unfortunately it, it seems to often fall to the people who are struggling the most to do it that um and then the university says you know well, you shouldn't be doing that. That's why you can't write essays, which just isn't true. It's uh, very similar to my own experiences. And I think uh, the, there's so much stats out there. There's so much research out there that just highlights again and again and again that sort of isolated feeling that you're the only one doing something in, in, in your sort of immediate vicinity at your institution or your university. And I think it, it, all of the work, you know, my time in as a disabled student officer and then subsequently is, you know, it's about it's about making that challenge because it, in, in my view, it also helps my mental health. Um, you know, that sort of frustration that I have in my day to day experience of interacting with people who are, you know, using the wrong pronouns or uh, forgetting my access needs and things. They're m minor things, but that sort of pent up injustice builds up and I, it's it, activism as release. I was wondering if you felt that, you know, you've mentioned that, you know, universities sometimes say, well, you know, your mental health would be better if you weren't doing all these extra things or your studies would be better if you weren't doing all these extra things. And I've always thought, and I want to ask you to, is that the right supposition or does the activism actually support that mental well-being that uh, universities claim to be um, in supporting? Um, well, I think the only world in which my mental health wouldn't be improved by activism is a world in which it wasn't necessary anymore. So I don't think the, uh, you know, not to be, I kind of, too like, you know, the beautiful revolution is coming, but the it's sort of the only sense of purpose that I have really. So it's, um, it's also really interesting when you're working in things like, you know, I'm, I was, I'm in a humanities department, which is ostensibly radical. Um, and when the, you know, you're creating an issue when you're uh, trying to like have a problem at the university, but they want you to write all this stuff that's like really interesting and it's really radical and stuff. But when you're like, okay, well, what about if we try and enact those ideas now? And it's like, no, 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 no. You're making things very stressful for yourself. You should just write about other people that have, you know, that have done it. Um, and I think the the way that the university has become so separated from the work um, and that now when you have a kind of uh, well-being department, they're nothing to do with your department. They're completely separate. And there's just, you know, a couple of people who don't know anything about your course or your studying or anything like that. And even though obviously they should be able to kind of help nominally, they're actually not connected to anything you're doing at university. Um, and they're just you know, somebody who has a little room that you go and speak to. So of course, when you go and say to them, I'm all fired up and I've got all these ideas and, and this is what's like driving me right now. They're sort of like, let's calm down. Have you tried, you know, breathing? Um, and yes, you know, let's move on to more complex stuff. And I think that care just isn't at university right now. Yeah, I completely agree. I think that like, 
I count myself very lucky because before I came to university, I had like several friends who had been in the disabled people's movement for a really long time. And so that was where I learned about kind of like the social model and like ways to approach activism that like students unions, I think like really don't encourage because like a lot of my direct interaction has been with my SU instead of my university. And I think that like, as you use like a neoliberal capitalist hell machine as much as anything else and the bigger of a university you're at and the more money that an SU has the more entrenched that problem is generally speaking like a lot of the like most radical work gets done in quite small SUs because they're kind of like well yeah you want to do it so go ahead um and the more money an SU has which could theoretically be put towards change generally speaking the more constraints are put on the people that are meant to be representing people that want change and like so yeah so I always kind of felt that it was my responsibility to like be the person to other disabled activists with like the desire to do things but a lot of, not a lot of experience that had already been for me and I think for me like it comes into my faith as well because I'm Jewish and like one of the really central principles of Judaism is Tikkun Olam which is like the repairing of the world so I feel like that's where it comes into the mental well-being for me like I don't feel like I'm doing good things I can't go home at the end of the day and feel happy with myself if I haven't done a small thing to work towards that like it's very central to my mental health um which i think is like an interesting a lot of universities are pushing this is a kind of an aside a lot of universities are pushing for like culturally competent counseling at the moment and it's interesting to me because i think that a lot of university mental health services are like fundamentally incompatible with the idea in a lot of faiths and cultures that like it's our responsibility to push towards a greater better thing um yeah neoliberal capitalist hell machine is the takeaway here everything's a nightmare well well, thank you for those um, uh, really great answers that re really do resonate uh, with with my, with my own experience at university. Um, Leo, you, you mentioned SUs, and um, for for context, um, for those that haven't read it yet, the arriving at Thriving report mentions the the sort of lack of inclusion and accessibility of. Um, society and social opportunities at university as well as sports and volunteering um and there's there's quite a lot in there that talks specifically about disabled students because it, it's focusing on the disabled student experience but the, the the on the other side of the the aisle as it were on the queer side on the lgbt plus side there's report after report that highlights just how empowering and freeing attending university is for young queer people who may first encounter other people who they consider themselves like considering the the intersection of the that particular aspect or almost why we're here <laughs> have you got a uh, it's difficult to ask this question because i don't want to lead an, an an answer but have you got any experiences of trying to access um you know queer spaces at university or e even college even if you were that if your college was lucky enough to have those sorts of groups um and you know, in wider society in your community as well, because quite a lot of uh, my experiences with the queer community has been from not the university itself, but the, the surrounding um, local community. I was just wondering if you had any particular insights into both your lived experiences, but also um, any particular glaring issues um, that could be addressed. I mean, I came out very young like 10 um and I went I grew up in a really small town in Norfolk so I didn't have access to what would be considered a queer space uh for like I don't know 15 years after that um and when I first went to uni uh which I failed spectacularly um there wasn't really anything like that I went to uni thinking there's going to be this amazing explosion of of queer culture and you know like in a, a movie um film um but when I got to uni it was kind of I don't know it was just lacking and I think now it's become even I would say worse when I came back to uni um to do my undergrad again it, the the spaces were incredibly sanitized and it was you know there's a LGBT society but what they do is basically the same as any other society they all do the same things so every society has its own name you know we're the ones who like x cultural thing we're the ones who are queer we're the ones who are this and what do we do we go to prison we you know go on nights out we drink loads we wear funny costumes that's great um but it's not got anything to do with what i consider integral to my queerness um so the 
the spaces that were forged um, that were in my mind not to say what is and what isn't queer but queer as in queering the uh, you know the structures of of the normative um, were very much not in controlled or in, engaged with the university um, and they were people meeting each other and kind of having a more uh, organic you know um, way of, of building queer family that I think the university it's difficult because I don't know what role the university could have because I think it necessarily has to be more organic than they could provide um, but yeah the, the, the spaces are kind of sanitized and, and and don't really offer much for certain types of people is what I would say. Yeah I had a similar experience like um, the I was involved and in, I was on the committee of the LGBT society in my first go my second year of university for my sins and um, one of the issues that we faced was that because it was a welfare society we weren't like allowed to do any campaigning or politics otherwise we would essentially like lose our ability to like provide welfare services for LGBT people we wouldn't have access to the training and stuff like that so that was one of the first issues um, and there was a lot of like very unhealthy arguments that circled around that that kind of only served to like I think further push everyone on every single side of it into their corner which was not ideal um and then yeah I just also found that so I also like came out really young lived in like a smallish town um with like a weird number of queer people in it but um I when I came to university it was very strange because I think that like I spent all of my time at school kind of like feeling unable to be like desirable because of how like severe my dysphoria was and then I got to university and started hormones about a couple of years before that was when I got really sick and so had started using a wheelchair so just as I was at a point where I was slightly like more comfortable with my body I was like oh okay no now I'm just not an option anymore because people are trained to not perceive disabled people as like attractive and like potential partners and I think that I like, I know that sometimes when I talk about this, I come across as someone who's like standing on a table and like shaking my walking stick and being like, you have to have sex with disabled people. But like, it's so, it's so deeply frustrating when it's like Freshers Week and it's like the lies, like the Friday, the last Friday of Freshers Week and all of your like mates in your student house have like um, been like, oh yeah, I've gotten off with like 12 people and it's like 3 a.m. at a house party and people are crying because you're just talking about the fact that you're disabled and they're like, you're the most inspirational person I've ever met. And I'm like, I don't want you to think that I'm inspirational. I want you to think that I'm attractive because I am. Um, For me, a lot of my, you know, my research and also my life and experiences is, is um, just heavily anchored to uh, sexual violence trauma and the the kind of the reality is that a lot of things that people are diagnosed with are actually um, uh, ways to describe responses to trauma um, and a lot of people come to university already traumatized and already living with that whether they're diagnosed with something or whether they're not and the reality is that sexual violence is a huge um, uh, uh, it's trivial to say problem but uh, it's something that particularly people who are around the age of kind of 18 are, are very likely to have been experiencing and whether that's kind of, you know, um, something that's incredibly egregious or something that they're just around the culture of it all the time. Uh, and I think the the poor culture of um, consent education, I think consent is not a good enough term for what we actually need, but just to be brief, um, the the culture of teaching students about that is is nil and where there are things there are really poor provisions for it and they're not inclusive of disability they're not inclusive of queerness in a way that is truly meaningful um so what happens is you get all these young people who a lot of them are already in in states of kind of um uh well vulnerability and they're put in this melting pot where everybody is either having sex with each other without any guidance or really any thought about it or or not being having sex with and then left in a you know a different position so I think that that is something that universities are just terrible at dealing with and I think having a little workshop where you say you've got to come along and then we'll say to you no means no that is just nothing it doesn't mean anything um so yeah I think it's a really important thing to think like where are people when they're coming to university and often a lot of them are already incredibly vulnerable and they're put in like the most high pressure container of like be the best the most sexy the most cool the most funny and also the most academically successful right now mm -hmm. um with no support for that um you're completely right and i hadn't like i hadn't even 
consciously thought of that aspect of it when I was thinking about this discussion. But so like I am, um, I was the, I mean, content warning for this, but for sexual violence, I know we're putting one on, but I'm going to say anyway, um, I, I was lucky enough to have sex in Freshers Week. I was sexually assaulted. And because I was coming to university as an already traumatized person and as a disabled person, I was like, well, you know, at least someone wanted to. And it took me a year to report it because then I was like, because it was after then that I was like, oh no, actually I, I'm allowed, I'm allowed to not consent to things. Like I don't just have to take what I'm given because I'm disabled. Um, <laughs> and and it was as like my report was essentially like not believed because of the like just but like because of the because of the queerness of it because of the gender balance because female perpetrator male victim is not like a thing that universities are trained to respond to um and there was no like competence at all regarding the fact that it was like a queer sexual assault because I think that a lot of people's perception is like oh well, they just have sex all the time with each other and they don't that doesn't happen because they all want and it's because it's there's a very strange like Puritan perception of the way that like queer students especially engage with each other during university and it's just yeah bad. I think um this topic in particular is one that is close to close to my own experiences of university um you know the the myriad of hyper sexualizing disabled people uh, whether that's in queer spaces or not queer spaces, it happens in both. Um, you know, it, it's not a, a Venn diagram of isolated circles, but also the infantilization of disabled people, the then uh, hyper policing as well, or hyper protection of, you know, consensual activities that then, you know, people, it's two consenting disabled people or two consenting adults where people say, oh, why are you with that person? Why? you you know it always it, it's a bit weird if you two have a healthy sexual relationship and then you have the opposite where then when you do need support and you do need uh to be taken seriously and to not be infantilized and to be not condescend and to have proper accountability structures within both society and education it's not there and that that sort of damned if you do damned if you don't and also desexualized either way it is is quite a myriad of interconnecting barriers and not to you know make it incredibly difficult for you to answer this next question um but one of the one of the big issues that i always have is what's the what, what, what other than systemic overhaul of absolutely everything and building it from the ground up which i'm a huge fan of what sort of solutions or things can institutions do societies do in particular student societies because they are student supposed to be student-led and student-controlled and student-operated and the culture on campus is incredibly integral into how um disabled queer people feel included on campus we're just wanting to get your insight into uh, this particular topic because with when you know policing reform and on top of that to take sexual violence seriously but also we've talked about cultural competency with mental health services in, in a in an abstract way um but that disabled queer identity is statistically one of the most common identities um up to three quarters of queer people identify as disabled and similarly conversely um almost uh i think if i get my stat right two thirds of disabled people identify as queer um so we're the majority and our minority uh <laughs> to put it lightly i was just wanting to get thoughts ideas you're both quite active campaigners um within all of the things that you do whether it's academic or social or union based um just wanting to get your thoughts on that. Well, I think it's difficult because I can give you answers that I think are doable by universities, but I don't think are really, you know, ideal, but I think are, you know, steps in the right direction. Um, all of the societies that I've been involved in that I've in, found any kind of, well, that I've enjoyed that were different from the ones I described before have been um, kind of 
have sprung up and had a few sessions and we've done some things and then they've kind of you know left the wayside one of the reasons being that to be an official society at the university is such a complex process that involves all this paperwork you know 50 pages of paperwork and by the time you've done that everyone who was kind of interested in the first bit is like oh I don't really I'm not invested anymore and I think making that process easier would really um open the door to the kind of societies formed by queer disabled people are much more likely to be um sometimes transient not they're not going to be every week they're not going to be creating a money pot they're not going to be doing the same things and I think having a space to say the university will um recognize a society based on more that it's a group of people who want to meet up and do something and they don't have to justify themselves and they don't have to create you know a legal document to say this this is a society it's going to be this forever um on, on the flip side of that I would also say that you don't need the university to officiate anything that you do for it to be acceptable um, but this is just an idea of what a university might do if they were to better relate to students um, requests and and you know uh, create spaces for them and I think another thing is that for universities to even be trusted to do that they need to weed out their own um, like they need to uh, what's the expression like clean their own house whatever it is you know universities are the bastion of the massive transphobia epidemic that is in the UK and the absolute empty hollow words of a university saying like well this is a safe space for queer people they wouldn't say that it's like LGBT people and they've got someone who's writing articles about how all trans people are you know abominations and they're all here to like ruin uh, ruin feminism or whatever like that's just not it, it doesn't make sense and it's very difficult you're not going to get queer people to trust you if you're doing that um so yeah I mean that's a bigger ask but the, my first one I think is probably more actionable one of the things that I kind of like consistently say to people that are members of like disabled student like societies and associations is to like spend more time interacting with your local disabled people's organization than you do interacting with the SU because like that's like they will always be there in some form or another because they don't need like validation from a like because sometimes they might like go quiet and then come back up again but there will always be someone there in some form and also I think like the way that the disabled people's movement approaches activism is so much better than the way student politics approaches activism and I say that as someone who is like knee deep in student politics and that's like that's like an understatement um and and I think though is that like that's not always a logical step for like disabled people who have like come to university and are only just realizing that like activism is a thing they're allowed to do especially if you're someone that's been like living with a disability before you've come to university because then like your parents have been micromanaging everything and you've been on like an EHCP and you've been having meetings with the Senko every month for the like 12 years of your life um so I think that like SUs need to be need to do essentially the SUs need to do the difficult outreach work they need to be the ones to, to bridge that gap so they can send disabled people that way so like we don't have to do that ourselves because there are so many reasons why it's actually kind of difficult to sit down and do that which is why I tell people like this is a thing that I would recommend that you do but I understand it is not something that is as easy as just ringing them up and being like hi because none of us can do that because we're all yeah. disabled and we're all gay and like we hate phone calls um also like I know that this sounds basic, but literally just physical space. Like it is always so obvious to me when a university has been like, this is a space that I think disabled people would want to be in. And but why would they want to go clubbing? Why? OK, OK, I know that we have to. So we'll put a lift down onto the dance floor, but we'll make it so that because it's so packed, if you're in a wheelchair, what happens is that all of you form this tiny vanguard around the lift and you can't move and you get bottles of VK dropped on you all night um because they never actually thought that we'd use it like I think SU's and also universities well, really need to understand the principle of like if you build it we will come so you need to make sure that we can use it when we get there and also if you don't build it we'll come more just to annoy you so like it's easier in the long run for you to just make things that are accessible that work mm. very much agree uh as someone that worked as a physical design consultant if you're building a brand new nightclub after the pandemic because let's face it, once this pandemic is over, uh, there's going to be a lot more rene renewed interest in the first couple of months, maybe six months in those social connections. Uh, put the accessible toilet nearer the lift. Please don't make us have to cross an entire dance floor whilst we really need the toilet. Because uh, 
it's going to lead to accidents and not the ones that you want to clean up. One time I was told like, oh, one of our lifts is broken. So if you want to go to the toilet, you have to come up this lift and then out in the service lift. And then you have to go, it was snowing, by the way. Um, you have to go out the back of the SU, wheel yourself while very drunk all the way around to the front of the SU and then have the bouncer let you in and you've got to tell him to radio me otherwise he just won't let you in and then you can use the toilet and then you can just come all the way back around and it'll be fine. Uh, yeah I think um, I had a less like not that that's fun but that's a bit more of a lively point than the one I was going to make before but I'm going to say it anyway because I haven't got much Do time. Um, so another thing that is thinking about trauma and the reasons why you know thinking about the social model and, and why somebody might be anxious or depressed or have a personality disorder um is that uh the the idea of disclosure and it is so difficult in a university setting because they don't assume that everybody you know could have something going on um it means that the you're like okay i need to tell them because i need to tell them why everything is going really badly for me um but then you, you find yourself saying, well, I need to explain why. I need to explain why I'm like this. And then you end up with this kind of really, you know, uh, like a, an exorcism of everything that you feel like you need to say to justify yourself. And you're telling a personal tutor or you're telling, you know, when you finally get to the point where you feel like I can, I have to tell somebody. So I have to tell them everything because they never assume, they never provide provisions in, or they never, oh yeah, you can only provide provisions. They never provide in a way that assumes that everybody, uh, you know everybody needs something or or provide a space that says you know if you want to talk to us you can you don't have to tell us everything we'll just you know accept it so I think there is going back to that point at the beginning about being visible it is like you have to make yourself so hyper visible to the point of excruciation um and then that's it then everybody knows and that's who you are and there's no space to just you know just kind of exist yeah yeah fully like knowing that because I, I know who sits on like the mitsurks panel at uni or whatever so I know who's read the like the doctor's evidence and the psychiatrist evidence that have gone in can't even make eye contact with them in the student office anymore and it's like and even just to get basic stuff like content warnings on lectures about things that they should have already been content warning because yeah. it's horrific yeah. like just exactly there is just it's it's so excruciating moving through the world as a traumatized person anyway and moving through a world that is not only built for you but seems to be built to be hostile to you specifically <laughs> is just I hmm, it's not the one and there is so many very easy things that they could do but it would involve them just reconsidering their idea of what a traumatized person is and what a student is because they think that those must be two entirely separate things and they don't mm. realize that so many of us are moving through the world with trauma mm. I very much agree and uh simple things like including content warnings on content um mm. is it's so so simple to do and it's 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 similar along the lines of a lot of accessibility things it's more inclusive things are quite simple small little additions to how you do things and it always makes me both you know chuckle in a exasperated way that the university department with the most content warning is the film department and that's because content warnings have been part of films for decades now yeah. uh, whether it's epilepsy seizure or violence it's at the start of every single film about what content they've got and it's so mainstream there that they then don't apply that to their lectures um We've only got a little bit of time left, but what I wanted to touch on, um, and it is a big topic, so it's difficult to just touch on, is a big, an important part of a disabled student's journey at university is accessing healthcare. Whether it is your GP navigating away from, you're a student, so you need to see the student nurse, uh, it's an STD, of course. Uh, no, it's a chronic health condition I've had for 25 years. Um, but that intersection as well of trans identity, where too often you're sort of considered, oh, it's a trans issue, it's not a disability issue, we'll send you, you know, go to the GIC, the Gender Identity Clinic. I always forget what the acronym stands for. Um, oh, it's not, a, it's not a trans issue, it's a disability issue. Uh, and that sort of siloing and particularly if you're autistic as well um 
it, that thing of oh you can't be trans you're just autistic um i was wondering considering the topics that we've spoken about already and the fact that it often doesn't get brought up at all in in our sector um except in facebook rants to each other in you know three o'clock in the morning what are your thoughts and ideas of on this issue and in particular uh, to the professionals that listen to these, to the, to, that will be listening, what can they do to mitigate the, uh, the the distrust and the sort of disenfranchisement that we've already encountered and most dis disabled queer trans people have encountered um, in in that space? I think, mm. sorry. No, you go, you go. I was just going to say that, like, if there is a trans disabled person sitting in front of you, they know more than you about both transness and disability. And telling them that you know that is like the most crucial. Like, the reason that I trust the GP that I have now is because he is always very honest with me when he's like, you know more about this than I do. Or like, I, I will put here what you want me to say because this is about making your life easier. Like, he he knows that I know more than him because I've been dealing with like my disability and my transness for more than he's like had cause to be researching them that deeply and no amount of research can replicate lived experience. Um, and I think that like the reason that a lot of trans people and disabled people end up kind of like avoiding healthcare until the last minute essentially and which also to be honest ties in with like the the way that mental health is managed by like NHS trusts is that like if we feel if we feel that a doctor doesn't trust us there is no like that is that is the, I think that's the, the single most damaging thing because I think that that also comes from a place of, like there is like I don't want to call it generational trauma but like there is a community sense of trauma for disabled people about not being trusted by the people who literally have the power to decide whether or not we're allowed to live or die. Like, like if I am in a situation that reminds me of a benefits assessment, I don't want to try and convince them of anything. I want to get out of that situation as quickly as possible. And if you're setting up a situation that makes like it in a healthcare environment that reminds a disabled person of that, they're not going to want to talk to you. And you, that is like your failing as a doctor. Sorry, I've run it again. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I think there's there's something that's like that a lot of people don't understand unless they've been through the the mill. Um, and just to clarify, I love the NHS and think we should save it. But you know, if you've experienced the NHS for a long amount of time, then you also have your own uh, things. But it's like that because it's it's underfunded. That's why. Um, but the 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 issue is that if you're somebody who is outspoken and visible and you know that you're somebody who might say, I have a problem with the way this is being provided, not just because uh, at the point of me experiencing it, but I can understand the structure of why it's a problem and how it might affect other queer disabled people. The first time you raise, and raise a complaint or raise a, a query, that's like, OK, you've done that. The second time you do it, it's on your record. And if you do it any more times than that, you won't be trusted. But that is just a fact, um, unless you're in some kind of, you know, uh really forward thinking doctor's practice of which there are a few you know i studied in brighton and i went to one it was you know sort of like that but the more times you say actually i've got a problem with the way i'm being treated um the more times it's like well, we don't believe you and we're also going to try less to help you because that's just part of your problem is essentially the thing and i think being aware especially if you're um you know, a provider, if you're a mentor or chooses something, is, is a lot of the people that you're supporting will be going through that at the same time. And if you can provide a space where you do say, you know, you can complain, you can have a problem with it, you can say all those things, and I'm not going to trust you less. That's a really good piece of advice. And I think also don't assume that people want to talk about their gender, but also don't assume they don't want to. You can just ask. If you say to somebody, you know, especially in a mental health context, is this something that you feel is integral to our discussions about your mental health? Some people might say, no, I don't want to talk about that. It's something completely different. Um, and equally, some people might say, yes, thank you. I really need the space to talk about it. And I think just not assuming that because somebody turns up and they're, you know, because they're queer or, or even disabled, you know, a lot of people don't want to, that's not why they're in therapy or it's not why they've come to the wellbeing service. You just have to be, treat them as if they're somebody who you can't tell rather than assuming that you know what you can see is what you um what they want to talk about that's yeah 
I'd also mm -hmm. add, and this is erring quite close to the kind of like systemic overhaul kind of thing, but um, as someone, I, like as a disabled person, but I think to be honest, especially as a mad person, um, I feel um, like a lot of, um, I feel a kindred spirit with like children in the medical system because we're treated the same way. Um, like the cruel and unnecessary denial of agency of children that has been demonstrated by all of the stuff that's been happening recently with the GIDS is so emblematic of how they would love to treat all of us because transness makes you mad. It's, it's just a fact that when doctors look at you and they see like transsexualism on your records or whatever, you are being perceived as a mad person. Some of us are just better at kind of like taking the path of least resistance and not having our choices questioned as much because the more mad you are, the less agency that you have. Um, but like the fact is, is that every single trans person seeking treatment in this country is coming from a position of having fundamentally no agency at all. And that is like just being exemplified because children are the easiest to target at the moment. And I do not think that trans people will trust the medical establishment in this country at all until every single GIC has been abolished and it moves towards an informed consent system that you can, you know, be seen by um, during your time at uni rather than being referred the day you get there and getting in maybe when you're doing a PhD. Um, <sighs> very, very valid points. Um, in particular, the I think the siloing of particular you know, the, the gender identity clinics are quite literally, we don't want to deal with you in the, in the main system. So you, you have to go over there and we're not actually going to fund it. So here's a three and a half year wait, if you're lucky. Um, and the, the shared specialty aspect of complex disability impairments, you share that you have to go see a rheumatologist, you have to go see this person, you have to go see that person. And that lack of joined up lack of mainstreaming is you know very cross um cross identity because it's it's pretty much the exact same barrier is that they don't really want to deal with everything that you are as a human they want to solo each segment of you and take it apart and dissect it and you can see it in someone's eyes when you're sat in front of them that they mm -hmm. are trying to dissect you and take away just that tiny little bit that's their specialty my my one ask would be that sometimes um, you should ask, uh, well, not sometimes, you should always ask the disabled student in front of you if they would like, rather stay with you as a student counsellor than be referred to the NHS for that. Because more often than not, at least in my personal experience and people that I've talked to, it's much easier to talk to your student counsellor about your mental health and to have that sort of stability if they're a, you know if they're a good person in terms of understanding you because you can talk to them about everything and they're not going to silo it because they're not a specialty specialist and you won't get bounced around you won't get so so great some people want to see a specialist and that's important but at the same time some of us just want to continue with our education get through it get out the other side and until that culture of getting through university is abolished and re rebuilt from, you know, start to finish. We talk about the student journey a lot at DNA. We talk about that. The sector talks about it quite a lot. But that step by step process has to be a celebrate celebratory experience of education rather than I just need to survive this. Because if students' first response is, I just need to survive this, it, there's, it, it, it's an, it's, there, there's something in the system that's failing them. And, you know, that is, water is wet. Um, and, and that is, you know, it's, it's not been too long. It's only been 11 years since the Equality Act, and that still doesn't fully protect us. So don't rely on legislation. Don't rely on standards. Don't rely on systems of support that the student is telling you doesn't work for them talk to them believe them give them the agency that they deserve and that is not just to do with trans identity not just to do with disability but all aspects of that student journey would be my message as a summary so as a final as a final thank you to both leo and cassidy for for joining me um with this excellent um chat 
interview, podcast, whatever you want to call it. Um, I'd like to ask if you had, considering it was DNA's 10th anniversary this week, um, and you had to say where you would want, what you want to change within 10 years in, you know, just over 10 words. What do you think for you, as well as the people that you talk to and represent or work with, could really change how a student encounters and enjoys and experiences education? Free education, uh, um, like recognised gender euphoria and uh, free health and funded healthcare for everyone. I mean, that, I can't, I can't reduce that down anymore. No, I agree with that. <laughs> I can't follow that. I... <laughs> <laughs> That's all good. I mean, I think it really does. Is it really is a testament that when asking two excellent people about what would make a difference, it's fully funded healthcare and free education. And I think that is such a good summary of how the intersection between disability and other identities is, is very similar with a lot of other barriers that students face in education. You may not be a listener who identifies as queer or identifies as trans or identifies as disabled or identifies as having an impairment. But what you may feel is that financial crunch, that mental health crunch and that uh, healthcare crunch, particularly as we are in a pandemic and some of us have been shielding for almost a year now. So I think free education, fully funded NHS and free education is a good thing to finish on. Thank you for taking the time to listen and for Leo and Cassidy for joining me.